South Carolina's football team will have to show progression in 2024 after having a down year in 2023. But looking at the schedule for next year, that task is going to definitely be a bit challenging. You are Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome back to the Locked On Gamecock Podcast. I'm Andrew Lyon, the host of this podcast and also a staff writer for Gamecock Digest over on SI.com. Thank you all so much for making the Locked On Gamecocks podcast your first listener watch for your team here today. We are free and available both on YouTube and wherever you get your audio podcasts daily. Today's show is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE for $20 off your first purchase. Happy Friday morning or afternoon, everybody, depending on when you're listening to this podcast. I hope that y'all have had a great last couple of days. Uh, We got a lot to talk about on today's show because a lot has happened since our last show, which was on Wednesday when we went live after Raheem Rocket Sanders had committed to South Carolina. The Gamecocks have added a few more portal additions since that commitment took place. We'll touch on each of those guys in a little bit. And we'll also talk about of high school recruiting with resident locked on recruiting insider Brian Smith at the end of the show. But before we dive into all of that, I want to give y'all my thoughts on South Carolina's 2024 football schedule. The release or the uh, reveal was done on Wednesday night on ESPN and on the SEC Network. And when looking at the Gamecocks 2024 schedule, this is the best way to really stated it's manageable but there's going to be plenty of challenges lying in the Gamecocks path so let's go ahead and pull up the schedule real quick for those of you that are watching today's show on YouTube and for those of you listening on an audio podcast app do not worry I'll go ahead and read off the schedule real quick so that's fresh on your mind week one South Carolina's taking on Old Dominion that's followed up with games at Kentucky then LSU at home and Akron at home. They've got a bye week, then they play Ole Miss at home, they play at Alabama, and at Oklahoma. Then, they have another bye week. After that, they play Texas A&M at home, at Vanderbilt, Missouri at home, Wofford at home, and at Clemson. So there are 14 weeks now in the regular season, at least for the time being, two bye weeks because of the new format with the college football playoff, and quite frankly with how difficult the SEC is now going to be. So, the main thing I want to talk about is how can South Carolina get back to bowl eligibility? Because that has to be the goal for Shane Beamer and this staff after having a down year in 2023 and missing out on postseason play altogether. And the way that I look at this schedule is, truthfully, there's three different seasons comprised into one here for South Carolina. The first one that I want to touch on real quick are the first four games. Again, you got Old Dominion and Akron. Those are two wins right there in weeks one and four, respectively. But weeks two and three are going to be quite critical and might give us an indication as to how South Carolina might perform in 2024 because South Carolina plays at Kentucky in week two and then LSU at home in week three. With the Kentucky game, that's the Gamecocks' first road game of the season, obviously. And it's the first SEC game of the entire season for the whole conference. So that's going to definitely get a lot of attention in week two. And Kentucky, you know, hey, the Gamecocks have beaten Kentucky the last two seasons in uh, two, I would say, pretty close games. 2022 was more of a convincing win for South Carolina, but last year, obviously, it was an absolute nail biter. They're going to have a new quarterback that they're going to be rolling out in quarterback Brock Vandergriff, a transfer from Georgia, so that'll be interesting. Uh, Lenore Sellers, or whoever the new starter is for South Carolina, it will likely be their first road game of their career here with the Gamecocks. So that is going to be a very intriguing matchup. The LSU matchup in Week 3 is also very intriguing because... That's the first true road game of the season for the LSU Tigers. And 
They are also going to be breaking in a lot of new pieces, especially at the offensive skill positions. Quarterback Jaden Daniels is getting ready to move on to the NFL, and they're likely going to lose their top two pass catchers from their offense in 2023 in Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas Jr. at the wide receiver positions. And I believe both of those guys were 1,000-yard-plus receivers. Malik Neighbors, quite frankly, should have been the Blitnikoff Award winner, but they gave it to Marvin Harrison Jr. That's a whole different conversation. Point being, those are two tough conference games starting out against a physical Kentucky team that's looking for payback and an LSU team that just won nine games and had one of the most explosive offenses either way in all college football in 2023. Then you look at the final five games. You got Vanderbilt and Wofford included in that stretch. Again, I think those are two wins right there. But then you have three more toss-up games against Texas A&M, Missouri, and Clemson. Texas A&M brings in a new head coach in Mike Elko, so obviously a lot of turnover there in terms of some of the coaches on that staff and also some of the guys that are on their roster. We're not really going to know what the Aggies look like until probably halfway through this 2024 season. Missouri obviously coming off their best season in a very long while. Eli Drinkwitz, look. I know that a lot of people get annoyed by sort of how much he tries to be funny when he's on television and all that. But listen, you got to give the man credit. He has got things going up there at Mizzou. They're bringing back some big time pieces on offense. So that's going to be a big game for the Gamecocks. And obviously Clemson, look, the Tiger fans have already been letting Gamecock fans know about the fact that they lost to them a couple weeks ago. Clemson still is coming off of an eight-win season, which is still a down year for them. Continued regression from what we've seen from them the past few years. So, you know, we'll see what happens in that game. It is a road game for South Carolina, but as they showed two years ago, uh, they can win up there in Death Valley. So, again, that is definitely going to be a big game for them at the very end of the season. But the Stretch that really caught my attention when watching the reveal show on Wednesday night was the middle three games for South Carolina, where they're going to be taking on Ole Miss at home, and then they have two road games consecutively after that Ole Miss game, at Alabama and then at Oklahoma. We're going to term this as the gauntlet for South Carolina 2024. This is by far their toughest stretch of the season. And quite frankly, it might be the toughest three-game stretch for any SEC team in the conference in 2024. Now, they do have a bye week that takes place before and after that stretch. But, you know, as I told somebody on, I believe, X, the night of the reveal show, you know, they're not going to be thinking about that when it's halftime in Tuscaloosa. The team's not going to be going, oh, gosh, well, at least we've got a bye week two weeks from now. They're not going to be thinking about that at all. It's going to definitely test the limits of this roster and this coaching staff. Ole Miss... It'll be their second road game of the season when they take on the Gamecocks. Their first one is at Wake Forest. You could almost say that that's not really a road game because Wake Forest is literally in many ways like the Vanderbilt of the ACC. But they're going to return a lot of playmakers. Jackson Dart, quarterback, more than likely is coming back. Running back Quinshawn Junkins is coming back. And uh, Harris, their star wide receiver, is also set to return. And they are already being very active in the transfer portal. Ole Miss might try to be the Florida State of 2023 this next season they got a lot going over there right now that's going to be a tough game Alabama it's Alabama for gosh sakes it's taking place in Tuscaloosa as they showed a couple weekends ago Alabama they are still one of the top two or three programs in all of college football Jalen Milrow set to return from that quarterback and then Oklahoma first time ever that South Carolina is playing the Sooners in their program history. It's going to be in Norman, Oklahoma. It's going to be a bit of a homecoming for Shane Beamer, who was beloved there by Oklahoma's fan base. But the Sooners, hey, they do play Texas before that game takes place. The week before, I should say. So, you know, they could be coming off the heels of a very emotional victory or loss against their hated rivals in the Longhorns. So, South Carolina might have a bit of a scheduled dynamic advantage in that aspect. But... The bottom line when looking at this entire schedule for South Carolina is I see four guaranteed wins. Akron, Old Dominion, Vanderbilt, and Wofford. One guaranteed loss more than likely against Alabama. And the other seven games, to varying degrees, I would say are toss-ups. So, certainly not going to be easy for South Carolina, but if you're shaping in this staff, again, in my opinion, you've got to find a way to get the six wins. You cannot have five wins. You certainly cannot go to four wins or below. You go to four wins or below, 
We're talking potential hot seat. We're talking potential, uh, you might not make it to 2025. So it's going to be a tough conversation to have this offseason. But, you know, that's the reality of the SEC. And the road just got a lot tougher for you after Wednesday night. So certainly going to be interesting to see what happens with all these teams in the offseason and how things could shape up heading into 2024. But... With everything I just said about the schedule, there is no question that Shane Beamer and his staff, they are working very hard to try and upgrade multiple positions on this roster, especially from a depth standpoint. And they have done just that with their latest transfer portal additions. We're going to talk about each of those guys in just a couple moments right here on Locked On Gamecocks. Today's show is brought to you by Game Time. Now, it is officially the holiday season. We are about halfway through the month of December. And so you might want to uh, take some time and, you know, enjoy yourself with maybe your significant other or maybe you want to go and hang out with the boys. And there's a concert that's taking place later tonight that could be just the event for you as American rapper and Columbia native Jeezy is performing tonight at the Township Auditorium right here in Columbia. You can get floor seats for this concert as low as $189 or gallery seats for as low as $70. And you might be wondering, well, Andrew, it's Friday. You need to tell me this is tonight where there's not going to be any tickets left. You're not going to have to worry about that because you can snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Just download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On College for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Welcome back to this Friday edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your South Carolina Gamecocks every single day. And as always, a big thank you to each and every one of you everydayers who make the Locked On Gamecocks podcast your first watch on YouTube or your daily listen wherever you get your audio podcast daily. Coming into this transfer portal cycle, Shane Bieber and this staff, they had multiple needs that they had to address. And... One of those needs, kind of split up between a few different position groups, was depth. They had to get depth at several key positions, especially wide receiver, and then also running back after Mario Anderson Jr. decided to enter the transfer portal. And you could point to a couple other positions as well, especially in the trenches and arguably along that defensive line. Well, Shane Beamer and his staff, they've done a great job of addressing those specific needs in just the past 24 to 48 hours. So let's talk about a couple of their recent additions and commits they have gotten from the transfer portal. Starting off with Vanderbilt wide receiver Jaden McGowan, who made his pledge on Wednesday afternoon, I believe. And we've talked about Jaden McGowan already a couple times on this show, so not going to rehash too much. But needless to say, this is a very good get for the Gamecocks. For one, Jaden McGowan, he's got SEC experience as a starting wideout. You're not going to find that very often in the transfer portal. So that's a plus right there. Two, Jaden McGowan has got multiple years left of eligibility. Just two, but he's not some grad transfer or just basically one year stop and then moving on to the next phase of his life and or football career. So that is also a positive. And Jaden McCallum, we've again, talking about his skill set on this show, we have made it clear he is a Swiss Army knife. He is a very versatile player. He can help you out in terms of the passing game, taking the top off of a secondary. He can be included in some jet sweeps in the run game. And he also can help you out on special teams as a kickoff return man. He has proven himself in each of those phases of the game during his last two years up in Nashville. So he is going to help out South Carolina in that regard. And if he doesn't start, maybe Jared Brown from Coastal Carolina is the starting guy. He can give him a reprieve every so often as a rotational guy at that slot position as well. So needless to say, a good pickup all the way around getting J.D. McGowan from Vanderbilt. Now, the next guy that committed after J.D. McGowan on Wednesday was Pittsburgh defensive tackle DeAndre Jules. 
the first defensive line commit that they have gotten out of the portal. And in my opinion, it is a good one. Jules is a graduate transfer, so he's only got one year left of eligibility. He is six foot three, 310 pounds. So he's going to bring some immediate size to this defensive line. South Carolina, admittedly, has been a bit undersized along the defensive line for a very long time. A lot of guys that hover around 280, 295 pounds. A couple guys crack 300 plus, but not very many that have played consistently here. DeAndre Jules is going to change that once he arrives here in Columbia. And DeAndre Jules, look, he did not necessarily light things up at Pittsburgh, but for what his stats were in 2023 and six starts, uh, I think he could be a solid rotational player here. He had 24 total tackles, seven and a half tackles for loss, and two sacks in 2023 for the Panthers. So, again, probably not going to start for you, but DeAndre Jules, he is going to be vital in terms of rotating in for certain guys and making sure that the drop-off is very minimal. That is extremely important along your defensive line because unlike offensive linemen, those guys, they're not going to be playing the entire football game. You have to have a second-line defensive lineman that you can trust to rotate in every few plays with the guys that you have out there. So DeAndre Jules, especially in terms of his rush defensive skills, I think is going to help the Gamecocks in that regard on early downs on opposing drives. Now, the guy that I might be the most excited about out of this entire group is South Carolina State running back Jaworn Howell. I believe I pronounced that first name correctly. If I didn't, I apologize. I promise you I will learn how to. But this kid, I think he's got a chance to be basically another Mario Anderson Jr., a really solid find at a lower level at the running back position. How, first of all, he's a rising sophomore. He's got three years left of eligibility. I think that is great because you could not afford to get necessarily another running back that was only going to have one year left. Rocket Sanders, we know he's got one year remaining. Oscar Attaway III, I want to say, has one year left. I believe he does at least. Jawarn Howell, he has three years left. That is important. Two, He's going to bring size to the running back position. Howell is listed at six foot one, 215 pounds. So sure, he might have been playing for South Carolina State last year, but it wasn't because of his size. He's a pretty big boy at that running back spot. And he is also proven as a true freshman in 2023. Howell had 102 carries for 809 rushing yards. That's 7.9 yards per carry and seven touchdowns he led the entire MEAC conference in rushing yards and he did so well that he was named by FCS football central of fan nation shout out as an FCS freshman all-american selection by season's end so Jaworn Howell what I also like about his situation he is not going to be asked to have to step in there for South Carolina's offense immediately he's going to have a chance to sit behind Rocket Sanders and Oscar Attaway the third, and probably Juju McDowell as well, assuming that he is back with this team next year. And he will get to learn from each of those guys, learn from their experiences, learn maybe how to add some different moves to his arsenal. He's going to have a chance to sit behind some experienced, proven guys at that position and also adjust to life as an FBS football player, a player nonetheless in the Power Four and in the SEC. I think that that would be huge for his development to get some time to, again, just sit back and sort of weigh the wings and not get forced out there, hopefully, like Mario Anderson Jr. was forced out there in 2023 because of Takarian being a bit banged up, I believe, at some point, and also just needing a spark, really, at that running back position. That's not going to be a problem in 2024. So, Jawarn Howe, remember the name. This kid might be the Gamecock starting running back in a year or two from now. So really, really good pickups all the way around. All three of these guys definitely addressing needs in terms of depth at each of their respective positions. So with all the excitement going on with the transfer portal right now, we can't forget the high school recruiting cycle is also getting ready to reach an important milestone marker for the 2024 class, and that is early National Signing Day, which is just five days from today. So, 
What do you need to know about Santa Clara's final remaining targets for the 2024 cycle? I'll discuss that and a little bit more with Locked On's resident recruiting insider, Brian Smith, in just a few moments, right here on Locked On Gamecocks. Today's show is also brought to you by Prize Picks. Now, Y'all know the drill at this point when it comes to prize picks. They are the simplest and easiest daily fantasy sports app out there because all you have to do is go onto their app. You could select anywhere from two to six athletes from a variety of different sports and teams. You get a projected stat line for each of those athletes and you can select whether or not they're going to go more than or less than their projected stat line. So, for example, on Sunday, the Dallas Cowboys will be heading to Buffalo to take on the Buffalo Bills. I got two picks for y'all from this game. I think that Dallas quarterback Dak Prescott is going to throw for less than 276 and a half passing yards, while Bills quarterback Josh Allen, in my opinion, will throw for more than 263 and a half passing yards. I just think that this game sets up quite well for the Bills. Big time road win against Kansas City. It's going to be in the cold up there in Buffalo. Dallas has not played in that kind of environment all season long. It's on the road. I think that this has let down for the Cowboys written all over it. So if you agree with me or you want to check out some other games and or players, go to prizepicks.com slash college and use code LockdownCollege for your first deposit match up to $100. Again, that's prizepicks.com slash college and promo code LockdownCollege for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Welcome back to today's edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your team every single day in just 30 minutes. Before we wrap up today's show, we got some recruiting stuff that we're going to touch on here with Locked On's resident recruiting insider, Brian Smith. Brian, hope that you've been doing well as of late. Now, obviously, it's one of the busiest times of year with early National Signing Day coming up. A lot of these all-star games, you know, under our American game taking place down there in your neck of the woods in Florida. So I know that you got a ton you got to dive into, but for South Carolina, things are kind of slowing down the high school front for the 2024 class. It seems like uh, one of their biggest targets, Daniel Hill running back out of Mississippi, been one of their, um, been one of their biggest targets for the entire calendar year, but he took an official visit to Mississippi state this past weekend, Mississippi state uh, is well known with the Hill family because his father actually played running back for Mississippi State several years back. So, Brian, since then, there's been a couple predictions that have been put in for Daniel Hill to wind up in Starkville. Do you think that at this point it's fair to say that, you know, the waiting game may be just played out a little bit long enough for South Carolina, maybe they've moved on, or do you think that, you know, Holmes just calling for Daniel Hill? I can't imagine you would not want Daniel Hill, uh, but they got Levy over there at Mississippi State. And that offense is is really balanced and it's exciting. So maybe he just couldn't figure it out between the whole Alabama, South Carolina thing, and he's going in another direction. Um, to that point, Alabama is trying to recruit local kid Kevin Riley, who's a Miami commitment now, because I know they were the other one in the Daniel Hill. They've got Riley coming in this coming weekend. So something tells me that both the Tide and the Gamecocks are going to be out in the cold. Yeah, South Carolina already landing two transfer portal running backs, so one of them being Raheem Rocket Sanders from Arkansas, the other one Oscar Attaway, the third from North Texas, and they're still in the game for a couple of other guys in the portal, so that kind of seems to signal that for South Carolina, yeah, at this point, you know, they probably are willing to go ahead and just take their chances with someone else that already has college experience. But, you know, Daniel Hill plans to visit, or excuse me, plans to announce on January the 6th this next month. So, you know, who knows? We'll see if something changes because in recruiting these days, uh, things can change uh, at the turn of a hat. So we'll see how that one plays out. And, of course, uh, along with Brian Smith, you know, we appreciate him ha being on the show. And we also appreciate LinkedIn Jobs for sponsoring this recruiting segment here on the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. Because these days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business if you're a small business owner and that's why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash LockedOnCollege. Terms and conditions do apply. 
Now, Brian, getting back to the recruiting board for South Carolina, another intriguing target is wide receiver DeBron Gatling out of the state of Georgia. Now, Gatling was a longtime Texas A&M Aggie commit, but he recently decommitted from the Aggies. Obviously, a lot of turnover there with Jimbo Fisher being fired, Mike Elko being brought in, and South Carolina, at least from a number standpoint, they're in desperate need of wide receivers right now, and it could be a golden opportunity for Gatling to come here and play immediately and be a part of that rotation. So what are your thoughts on Gatling as a prospect, Brian? And sort of where do you see his recruitment um, heading over the next couple of weeks? His recruitment is pretty wild. Uh, LT Overton, who was the number one player, he reclassified, went to A&M. He was ahead of him in class. That was how I got to, to kind of see things up close because they're at Milton. Milton just won state championship last night, by the way. So congrats to Gatling and all those guys. But, I mean, that was the connection. LT and him knew each other. LT decided to go there. Now LT is in the portal and visiting Alabama this weekend. So that's not good for a and They have Their class has imploded. Uh, Gatling, I believe, is one of seven or eight guys that has decommitted from a and That's a lot. That's a lot. So he's a kid that's very long, very athletic. I've known him since he was in ninth grade. He played with Cam Newton's seven-on-seven team. He was, like, hand-selected. He's one of the guys that everybody knew about. And he committed early. He kind of went off the recruiting scene because he committed like a year ago. But he could play. Uh, he's got length. He's got natural hands. He can play in the middle of the field, natural route runner. I would not be surprised at all if he went to South Carolina, if he did get a chance to play early for the Gamecocks. Since you brought up LT Overton, I will just ask you real quick, because I know that the Overtons have deep connections with Alabama, so maybe he does end up with the Crimson Tide at the end of the day. But Overton, he did visit South Carolina this past weekend. They got the first visit. Um, and many transfers, you know, they take only one or two visits before they make their decisions. So it at least seems like that LT is listening to Shane Beamer and the staff and what they have to say, what they have to pitch to him in terms of what he could do here. Um, do you think that maybe there could be some sort of package deal between him and DeBron, or do you think that the age gap or the experience gap at this point is just too wide to where it might not make a difference really no matter what? My guess is that they're kind of talking amongst themselves. Again, they're friends. They played the same high school. I'm sure that played a factor. Um, for those that don't know, LT and his parents lived in Tuscaloosa at one point. Either one or both of them worked at the University of Alabama. <coughs> Excuse me, literally. So that's the connection there. But South Carolina just recruits Atlanta so hard and they need D linemen so bad, it's got to be appealing. You know what I mean? Like he would play. So they're in the game that they got the first visit. They have to be. And I, I would not be surprised if that's where he ended up. Yeah, South, yeah, South Carolina, a really good experienced uh, starting line on the defensive line, but certainly in desperate need of depth. And when you have a bunch of upperclassmen, obviously, then you're looking at your freshmen, sophomores. And I think South Carolina would like to see some upgrades made at a couple of those positions along the defensive line. Uh, Brian, once again, appreciate you coming on for today's show. One last thing before you go. Uh, just a curiosity question about National Signing Day, because obviously there's been a lot of topics uh, surrounding the month of December regarding, you know, how much these coaches are having to deal with, uh, the chaos of it all with the transfer portal, early National Signing Day. So my question to you is this, Brian, if you were the czar of the recruiting world, if you had the ability to make changes, would you get rid of early National Signing Day altogether and leave it to where it's just the February National Signing Day? Or would you maybe move it to August and, you know, give kids a chance to opt out of their letter of intent if coaching changes were to happen, things of that nature? Two parts to that. Number one, there's no good time to have it because football is a developmental sport, especially linemen. Having it before their senior year for a lot of kids would be harsh. But kids that are like DBs, you usually know by the end of their sophomore, early junior year. It's wild. So it's going to be harsh no matter what you do in terms of the timing, too, because right now all of the following, you got the portal, you got coaching changes at the college level, high school level, everything. And then, oh, by the way, there's a bowl season. So you got too many moving parts. I get it. Transfer portal, this and that. It, it's pain. But I don't see how the high school thing going to August is going to help much because all the coaches, have fall camp, they can't really do anything with recruiting. That's kind of a dead period as a general rule, too. So, yeah, I don't know what you do. I, I really don't. I, I've talked to a lot of people about it. I wish I had a better answer. But right now it's rough because it's too many parts moving around in December. I, I can't keep up. I know that, and I and I love recruiting. But it's it's really, really hard. 
Yeah, no, without a doubt, you know, it's it, it's tough on everybody. It's tough on coaches. It's tough on people that are in the recruiting world like yourselves where, you know, again, like especially with NIL now, you know, let's be honest, there are certain recruitments with high-profile kids, and I'm sure you could throw out a couple if you wanted to. I'm not going to make you, but, you know, a couple kids where NIL is probably a big part in their final decision. Maybe they're taking last-minute official visits because of it. Uh, you're seeing that taking place for multiple schools, even the biggest of programs in college football. So, um, again, I'm certainly glad that I'm not someone that has to, uh, you know, make any decisions on those sort of things. I'm sure you are as well. But, yeah, it'll be interesting to see over the next couple of years if anything changes regarding the recruiting calendar with the month of December and the entire cycle as a whole. He is Locked On's resident recruiting insider, Brian Smith. Brian, thank you so much for coming on to today's show. Uh, for those who may be catching your insight for the first time ever here on the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, first, thanks you all for watching and listening to the show. And uh, secondly, Brian, where can they find all of your work on recruiting? 